is the first time you met uh, Jean Michel? I met him at the uh, Mud Club, I think. Probably in about, um, you know, 79. Was this the peak, the summer of 79, when the mud was. When was. I think I think I met him, uh, I don't know, 79 or 80. I knew him for about a year before I before I had anything to do with his art thing. Did you know his his Sambo stuff at all? Yeah, after I knew him, even after I saw him with the mohawk, you know, that was what attracted to me, him, the fact that he was black and he had this mohawk, and that he was a nice person. I liked him and talked, you know, spent quite a bit of time talking with him. Mm -hmm. That was before Fred, I think, mm -hmm. I met Fred, and um, then I knew his friends, Al Diaz, you know, the other Samuel. Mm -hmm. And um, then who was the other guy that lives uptown? It um, was in the band Gray. And, like Danny Rosen was hanging out with him. And well, uh, let's see, who was in that band? Michael Holman was in that band, wasn't he? Or no, it wasn't. It was, not, it was. I didn't know Michael Holman. I didn't associate Michael with Jean Michel at that point. This guy, Matt Priest, the, um, the DJ that Michael uses all the time, was in that band as well, I think. In Gray, you mean? Yeah. Well, actually, Greg became, it was like a year later after I knew Sean. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was like when I saw them at university, like at Mickey Ruskin's club. That was a short-lived project, though, right? Yeah, but that was a, at least a year or a year and a half after he first started going to the Mud Club. What, what was he like when he first started going? What was he like? Um, he had a blonde mohawk, or a... He may have, I don't remember. He had a mohawk. Um... I remember he did have a blonde at one period. I don't know if it was right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I just I would see him in Soho. He sort of hung out on the streets of Soho, sitting on you know steps and stuff, like next to the Tamala and Bagel place, you know, on Prince Street, and mm -hmm. just sort of hanging out. And um, you know, he never had any money, and and he was always like asking for money or something. I don't know if he asked me for money, but he was always broke. And he always needed a place to sleep, and I never let him stay at my place. He always asked if he could sleep at my house, because he never had a place. I don't know if he had been living in Brooklyn at that time or what the story was, but mm -hmm. he always needed a place to sleep, as did like Lisa Stroud every night, as did two or three other people. And I just liked my privacy too much to get involved with becoming a, mm -hmm. a hostel for like younger kids. So mm -hmm. Anyway, then um, I was living on Delancey Street at that time, I think. And then, um, what happened? I remember then he, um, he I started seeing these Samuel things and liking them, and I thought it was really kind of bright, you know. And um, then um, I would see him around Mary Paul's house up on Broadway, and he was became friends with Glenn and Mary Paul and Ado, primarily, I think, were his closest friends. And um, then gradually, I think this um, film project came up. I think the graffiti thing started happening. I think I was going up to Soul Artists or whatever that was called, mm -hmm. and I brought I was the one that brought Keith up there for the first time. And um, Fred had like, I think Fred was friends with Jean Michel maybe by that time. They got it. They got all this money from Fiorucci and Rizzoli to make this film. And Jean was the star of the film. And it was about an artist who becomes successful in the art scene. So he was like, really needed money, and they weren't paying him very well. And he'll tell you about that if you ask him. Mm -hmm. But, um, I mean, he still has a kind of grudge about that film. I think he only got $1,000 or something altogether for like a couple months worth of work. And um, they had a big budget, too. I mean, they had like a few hundred thousand dollars, maybe half a million or something. A lot of it went into drugs. Most of it probably. So, um, then, um, he was always asking, I said, why don't you, at some point in that August, I said, why don't you just make some paintings and drawings and incorporate these things you do on the, on the street into, you know, I think that that's, you know, if you want money, make those. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll help if they're good, you know. And he made a few things there in that place, and they were fantastic, you know. Mm -hmm. And right then, um, I said, well, you know, this is really great. Make some more. And I think I sold a few things. And 
Do you remember just, the date that that was? August 1980. Mm-hmm. On Great John Street, second mm-hmm. floor above the Great John's Cafe. Then I think maybe by October he made a big piece on raw canvas and he sold it to Debbie and Chris Stein. Then he prepared some other pieces which were eventually in the in the um, the PS1 show in um, February. He was the only person I, I thought was so fantastic as a real major artist that I gave him a whole wall mm-hmm. and, and, and put paintings on, on, on canvas. How many pieces did John show him? He had only about, altogether, about 15 pieces. But it, it Drawings, an collages, wall. and paintings. Mm-hmm. But it took up an entire wall. It's yeah. And, it, and that last room was sort of like empty-ish, you know. Mm-hmm. So it really gave him a, a strong place. The only other thing in that room was like a wall. I call it the Wailing Wall because it was this John and Yoko own. It was kind of right after he had been shot in December. And this was kind of like all the Tannenbaum and um, very intimate photographs that had never been seen of, um, mm-hmm. by Tannenbaum and um, what's his name? Gruen. The double row of their mm-hmm. things or four rows or something. So really it was kind of empty room of just his art and those photographs. So it was kind of a weird juxtaposition. And, um, and Jean-Michel used to come in and just sit and look at, look at the, uh, the wall. Do you remember that at all? Which wall? In PS1. He used to come and just hang out and sit and look at the, uh, look at his pieces. So amazed that they were up on a wall. And I never heard that story. Yeah, yeah. It might be true. I don't know. He told me that story. Just the only story I remember further about that installation or something was um, which didn't really come out in the Times article, but I did bring, I brought Henry Geltzahler and, uh, well, Sandro Kia wanted to buy the one biggest painting there, and he wanted to pay like $1,500, and I said no, $2,500. And at that time, for, none of these young people had really started, I mean, sure, Julian and David, in a way they were like another generation, mm-hmm. but even then their prices weren't that high. Mm-hmm. They were still under $10,000, and I said $2,500 for his first painting for sale. And um, Christoph Di Manil finally bought it for that price. Mm-hmm. But um, Sandro Kia, I said, no, it's too, you know, I said, no, I'm not going to buy it for $2,500. But he did, Sandro did bring Emilio Mazzoli and, and um, what's his name, uh, Achille Bonito Olivo from, from Rome and from Modena to my studio to look at his work. And they gave him his first show, and Emilio gave him his first gallery show mm-hmm. in Italy.